All right, so uh, we're going to delve a little bit deeper uh, into trademarks. All right. Um, and I want to talk about two types of trademark protection. All right. The first and oldest is common law trademark protection, which really originates from equity and fairness. Um, and it did even exist in uh, England. So it kind of came over on the Mayflower. And the idea was that if you had a trademark, color scheme, trade name, and you used it to market your goods or services, you had a common law trademark right. And you could sue for infringement if other companies tried to use uh, confusing marks. Okay, so um, that was that's common law trade. The shortcomings of common law trademark protection is you only had protection in the markets in which you had competed. So, in other words, if I open a hot dog stand in Cincinnati that has distinctive logos and uh, family is on vacation from Seattle uh, and they see the uh, logo, the color scheme, they like it and they open up a similar, tr similarly trademarked uh, hot dog stand in Seattle. I would have no protection under common law because I hadn't previously com competed in that market. So that's how common law trademark work. So obviously that was somewhat problematic. So federal trademark laws, um, as we know them, really started to take shape with the Lanham Act uh, in 1946. So you could register your trademark and that gives you protection not only in the entirety of the United States, but also internationally due to treaty. All right. So that's why even if you have used your trademark, in fact, you have to have used a trademark to register it. So you can't register trademarks that aren't being aren't in use. All right, you have to create it, use it in commerce, and then you're eligible for federal trademark protection. All right. Uh, but that's how the interplay between common law trademark protection and federal protection under the Lanham Act work. So what can be trademarked? Obviously logos. Uh, perhaps you've seen this one. Um, that's a, um, And we see this little R, that means it's a registered trademark with the USPTO. Slogans, all right? Now here, and I'm sure none of you have ever seen this uh, logo before, but this is Budweiser. They make um, beer, malt beverages, if you will. Um, and uh, so we've actually got a couple of trademarks here. Because um, the Budweiser bow tie is trademarked. All right. Uh, that's a trademarked uh, logo. This Budweiser font and the name itself are trademarked. All right, and we see this registered trademark. But if we look, we also see another registered trademark logo here. Uh, and it's a trademark slogan. King of beers, and there can only be one king, of course. And uh, according to the USPTO, it is, in fact, Budweiser. So if I develop my own beer, I could not market it at, as the king of beers. I would get a, um, if I were to do so, I would get a strongly worded cease and desist letter uh, from Budweiser's attorneys. All right. Uh, Nike, swoosh, obviously that's the logo and the, the uh, slogan, just do it. All right. Uh, notice Nike does not use the registered trademark logo anymore. Um, it's not actually required. It's just uh, suggested. Um, 
and another um, taste the rainbow trademark slogan all right you can also trademark sounds all right so below this lecture, I'm going to link to the USPTO uh, Soundmark um, website, and they have several samples. Uh, and, and, I, and I encourage you to access that site and click through. Some of them you'll recognize. Um, Homer Simpson's Dope is is there, and um, the if you're at the beginning of movies, the MGM, the Lion Roar. Uh, is there and several other interesting sounds so I'm gonna link that below but no you can also trademark a sound right as many of you are listening to this you're listening to it on your uh, Apple PC um, or your lap your Apple laptop well when you cut that on it has a gong sound well guess what that's trademark you know if I were to create uh, my own line of laptops they can't start up like that all right, they are they can't make that sound, I should say, uh, upon startup. All right, so w there are two main torts that we'll need to be aware of uh, as it relates to trademarks. The first is infringement. All right, um, so the dispositive or the key um, trait of an infringement claim is a mark that is confusing you know I go to buy one thing and I buy the product of another company because the trademarks are confusing to the consumer all right that is the essential claim in a trademark infringement case all right keep in mind it doesn't require intent so accidental infringement is still infringement and you can be sued and held responsible for accidental infringement. The idea being that when you bring product to market, you have a responsibility to uh, look for similar logos. All right. So what does an infringement case look like? All right. Well, Aquafresh for over three decades has marketed its it's toothpaste uh, using this shape with three stripes. All right. A um, little bit of trivia here. Uh, that shape is actually called a nurdle. Um, so uh, feel free to use that next time you want to impress your friends at a party. Because um, uh, that never comes up in life, but you know it now. So the shape of toothpaste on your toothbrush is called a nurdle, all right? Uh, Colgate brought its triple action toothpaste to market and it featured a um, similar shape with also with three colors, all right? Aquafresh uh, took exception and sued. Uh, well, actually, they sent a cease and desist letter to Colgate, all right? Um, they settled out of court so we don't have the terms of the uh, settlement but what we do have is the redesigned Colgate box alright so they took that that shape and the nurdle uh, off of the Colgate tube right and you can see how this might be confusing alright uh, because if you went to the store to get Aquafresh and you're used to looking for that shape, you might have picked up the same box, presumably with the same color schemes. They were both red boxes. Um, so Colgate did change that. All right. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is... Airbase Industries versus Marvel Rights LLC, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Disney. All right. So what we're looking at is an air compressor. All right. Um, it's a product of Airbase Industries. All right. Um, 
And if you're not familiar with what these do, um, this cylinder, you can, uh, there's a, a motor here that compresses air under high pressure in this cylinder, and you can connect um, any air tool. You can use it to inflate car tires, you can use it to drive a nail gun, a uh, staple gun, um, you know, air wrenches, any, any air tool. Um, you, you can hook up to it. All right. Um, it is worth noting, Airbase Industries is not in any way affiliated with Disney, right? They're, they make uh, air tools. What we see here is just a cutout from the um, Hulk or one of the Hulk movies uh, in a block font. So um, Disney took exception with this air compressor they didn't like the block font the color scheme um, also the most recent hulk movie uh, the slogan that disney brought it to market with was unleash the fury all right um, and so collectively uh, disney i mean if you just from an objective standpoint you might think that uh, there's a tie-in here, like this is uh, endorsed by the movie or Disney or some Marvel character, i.e. the Incredible Hulk, uh, and it's not. There was no financial agreement between Disney and Airbase Industries, so it felt like free ridership. Disney is a company that is very uh, aggressive when it comes to protecting its intellectual property, so they will, uh, they tend to sue first and ask questions later. All right. And that's what happened here. All right. Didn't go to court. But Airbase Industries did redesign their air compressor. They still call it the Hulk. Disney doesn't own the word the Hulk. Right. They um, did change the color scheme. Uh, and they did away with the Unleash the Power tagline on the the uh, air compressor. But, you know, they painted it a different color. Functionally, it's the same. It just does not look like there's a tie-in uh, with the Hulk movies. All right. Um, again, out-of-court settlement, so we don't know if there was a financial uh, change or not. Um, I, I will say this is similar to David and Goliath. Disney is a huge company. They own ESPN, ABC, and uh, obviously Marvel Rights was a party to this um, lawsuit. And Airbase Industries was a relatively smaller company, so there may or may not have been, uh, probably weren't. Disney was probably okay with the redesign, but uh, that's my speculation. Anyway, those are a couple of examples of trademark dilution, uh, trademark infringement. All right. So let's shift gears for a minute and talk about trademark dilution. All right. It's the second tort I want us to be familiar with as it relates to uh, trademarks. All right. And it occurs uh, when a similar trademark is used. It causes an association. And there doesn't have to be any confusion here. So with trademark infringement, think confusion, right? With trademark dilution, the test is an impairment or damage to the protected trademark. All right. So that's what we're looking for here. A few examples I pulled. All right. Um. So Ben & Jerry's, it's, it's a company, good wholesome company we've talked about. Uh, they are a B Corp and a Benefit Corp, all right? They, they give back to the community. Um, they stake a lot on their company's reputation, all right? I just have XXX here. Um, the, the case at issue was Ben & Cherry's, which was... Um, a uh, studio producing ice cream themed uh, adult entertainment or pornography. All right. So I'll spare you the logo. Um, 
but Ben and Jerry's did sue. And they didn't have a case for trademark infringement because there's not any confusion. Because if you're wanting ice cream, uh, there's not a good chance that you're going to come back with, uh, you know, pornography and, and vice versa. So there wasn't really confusion. So it's not infringement. But the idea was that um, the comparison, the Ben and Cherries, the similarity, changed, uh, well, well, potentially damaged the wholesome brand that Ben and Jerry's had created. All right. And Ben and Jerry's wins this case. All right. So they do, in fact, are, in fact, successful. All right. That's an example of a successful trademark dilution case. Up next, we'll talk about an unsuccessful trademark dilution case. All right, and I'll, I'll link to all of these um, below this lecture. This is Louis Vuitton versus Hot Diggity Dog that makes uh, dog chew toys. So uh, obviously we have the picture of a high-end handbag on one side and a picture of uh, a dog chew toy, obviously inspired by the handbag, on the the other image. All right. So Louis Vuitton did not find this interest. They didn't. They didn't get the joke. All right. Uh, and they sued Hot Diggity Dog, which is the manufacturer of this dog chew toy, uh, for trademark dilution. All right. They are unsuccessful. Louis Vuitton loses this case. Um, the judge in the case finds that there isn't any, or there's very, very minimal risk of the dog chew toy impairing the brand of Louis Vuitton. All right. And obviously, there's zero risk of confusion here because if I wanted to. Uh, give one of these as a gift to my wife. Um, there's very little chance that I accidentally pick up this, right? Pick up the the dog chew toy, right? So obviously it's not an, an infringement case. Is it trademark dilution? And the judge in this case said no. And the reason being, it actually tends to bolster the brain. Uh, it in, it tends to increase the cachet. Uh, our reputation of the brand, this type of imitation does, and it's a protected parody. So Louis Vuitton loses this case. All right. 